Wheel on come and get me select a black knight at the controller. Fling down selection. Rap a tam tam and run things about ya. from Africa, you can hear it. One love, we are one people, one nation. Big up everybody, it's one heartbeat and one creation. This station is Mornington Crescent. Please proceed to the next station. In questo nostro viaggio londinese abbiamo avuto l'onore e la fortuna di incontrare Chris Blackwell, il produttore bianco che ha giocato un ruolo molto importante alla nascita del reggae con la produzione di hits come Boogie My Bone di Lore Lightken e che in seguito scopre personaggi come Jimmy Cliff e soprattutto Bob Marley giocando un ruolo fondamentale nella diffusione della musica del, del grande re del reggae in tutto il mondo. Lo andiamo ad incontrare proprio a casa sua dove ci ha invitato. Another day, another day, another day. The boat was uh, ran out of gas. We were stranded a long way away from anywhere, which is an area now called Helsha Beach, but at the time had no uh, people living there. I went out to look for some help, and there was, there was nothing around, so I, wa I walked along the coastline for a great deal of time, maybe six, seven hours, starting at six o'clock in the morning, and. Uh, eventually came across a beach, and on the beach there was a little cottage, a little hut, I should say. I went towards it, this uh, uh, Rasta figure put his head through the window, and at the time, this was like in the late 50s, maybe 56, 57, 58, somewhere around then, uh, the Rastafaris were very much sort of outlawed in Jamaica. They had a lot of uh, negative publicity about them. They were um, self-employed in that they were carpenters or fishermen or musicians, etc. But in general, they were, they were not well known or they were sort of outcasts in general. They were always written up as being murderers and uh, very anti-white people. Uh, etc. So when I saw this person, I was actually quite nervous. I asked him, could I just lie down for a little bit? Because I was really tired, and he said, okay, you can lie down for a little bit. Uh, when I woke up, it, uh, night had fallen now, and there was six or seven other Rastafari in the room. And I was very scared when I woke up. But they 
all, all they were doing was reading to me from the Bible, and they were far from what I'd read about, far from what I'd heard about. <clears throat> In fact, quite the opposite. They were very gentle and very uh, peace-loving. And um, so, obviously, it, um, that experience changed my whole opinion a huge amount about Rastafari. Do you remember me? Remember me, Come remember on. me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me. Vivian Goldman, una scrittrice, una giornalista che ha vissuto in prima persona i giorni del punk, ha condiviso tempo importante con Bob Marley e i Wailers in tour, amica di Bob Marley ai tempi, è testimone del flusso creativo che ha generato Exodus, ha scritto un libro bellissimo appunto su questo capolavoro che si chiama The Book of Exodus e adesso vive a New York City dove insegna punk e reggae in una università dedicata all'arte. When it comes to the Exodus album, it was very lovingly sequenced by Chris Blackwell. And when you had it on an album, as opposed to a CD or a digital download, it really takes you on an incredible journey. It was his reaction, in part, to the assassination attempt that occurred at his home. On the Exodus album, on the first side, there's a lot of very confrontational songs you know, like guiltiness. These are the big fish that always try to eat down the small fish. Mm -hmm. They would do anything to materialize their every wish. You know, he's looking very honestly at the evil within people and what people will do to one another. And yet at the same time, it's a great gift how at the end of the album, It's like he walks you through the valley of the shadow of death. And at the end of the record, he releases you into a sort of joy with songs like Three Little Birds and One Love, songs of healing, songs that give you strength to go on and face the challenges that we all face. And I have to say that the message of Exodus, which also is very important to realize, that in a sense the key message of Exodus is not only for all the struggling refugees, also refers to a journey of consciousness within oneself, an inner journey, an inner realization, and an inner awakening, you know? I think that is really the movement of Ja people that Bob refers to. London Underground, la metropolitana di Londra, una cosa che rimane in mente a tutti i visitatori e come scrive Alex Roggero nel suo bellissimo libro Un treno per Babylon, la metropolitana che raccorda i vari quartieri di Londra con le loro comunità come i cinque continenti e i tanti paesi del mondo e ovviamente tra questi popolosi quartieri ci sono anche luoghi importanti per la storia del reggae qui a Londra come Notting Hill, primo centro dell'immigrazione di giamaicani subito dopo la guerra e per esempio Brixton, giù a sud. of the very first Jamaican people in London were, were living here in the late, late 40s and in the 50s. Yes, yes, yes. every fought in a war, everything. It's only in a few years, it was about 10, 12, 12 years ago, the first time every black man got, got and um, started to speak up for themselves. Because um, most people around here don't speak up for themselves, right? They don't tell the true fact. They think uh, they portray a pretty guy driving a plane. They don't say that a black man driving a plane. And bomb, the biggest bomber tr uh, plane that's made more bombing trip to Germany is a black man driving. And they always portray that white man done it. And it's never been, right? But we fought in a war and then we fought here to make everybody walk peacefully, every nation, to walk peacefully in the street. And without us, nobody survived here. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. 
Do you remember me? Remember me? Remember me? Remember me? Yeah, yeah. Remember me? Remember me? Remember me? Remember me? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me? Remember me? Hey, now. Never Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the network service update broadcast. I'll be here to change here for the central line. E siamo arrivati a notte in Il Gate, la primissima generazione di immigrati caraibici è denominata Windrush Generation perché eh, la Windrush è la prima nave che portò eh, le, le prime centinaia di maestranze caraibiche tra cui oltretutto c'erano alcuni musicisti di Calypso come Lord Brinner e Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener. Now I'm told that you are really the king of Calypso singers, is that right? Yes. London is the place for me. London, this lovely city. You, you can, can go, go to France, France or America. America. India, Asia or Africa, but you must come back to London City. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, hey. Tante cose a Nottinil che riguardano la comunità caraibica, il famosissimo carnevale giamaicano che nel giro di pochi anni è diventata una delle più grandi manifestazioni en plein air europee, è un carnevale tra l'altro fantastico. Nottinil ha anche scena di importanti avvenimenti sociali durante gli anni 70, per esempio i famosi riots al carnevale del, del 76. Once more time, it was very, you could cut the ear like a knife, you cut the ear when you're breathing between white and black, mm -hmm. right? And it was that thick, the, the tension. Yeah. And Reese cleared it. And Jamaica... You're, you're referring to the riots uh, yeah, in the yeah, middle yeah, 70s, yeah, 76, yeah, 77, yeah, yeah. with the punks. We, we couldn't walk at night, we couldn't walk at day. So, so you were experiencing very hard the uh, racial tension in the yeah, 70s? Before that, It was worse, much worse. We got the high, uh, highs angel, teddy boys, everything. The attackers left, right and center. We had to defend ourselves. We drive, drive them away. And then they keep on threatening to come back and have us. But they never come back because we prepare for them every night and they never come back. <laughs> I've been in London since a long time, in this area, Portobello Road. Um, no, I, don't, I don't live here, I work here, just up the road. Okay. Yeah, two, two years, two or three years. So do you know about uh, the history of, of this area, like uh, the Jamaicans living here yeah. since, the, since the late 40s? Yeah, I mean, it's had quite an interesting history because there was the wind rush, I think, that was in the early 50s or 60s. Uh, I might be a bit wrong. Early, uh, late 40s, like 1948, the, 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 the wind rush. Yeah, the wind rush, so, you know, a huge population, for West Indian population being here. And then slowly, slowly, I think the area has become more and more gentrified. Um, with certain celebrities living here and, and the rise of the popularity of the, the carnival as well. Do you know any Jamaican people? Do you, did you experience uh, any contact uh, with, with Jamaican people here in London? Yeah, there's lots of people around this area who are Jamaican, yeah. Do you like Jamaican culture, as I don't know, the cuisine, the music, the, the, the dance? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that much about it. I mean, you know, you get snippets in London, but yeah, I think it's a really interesting culture. Um, I've, yeah, the, the cuisine seems good, the jerk chicken and yeah. And, and do you like reg reggae music? What are your favorite reggae artists? Um, oh, I don't know. I quite like dub. I used to quite like dub music, like Mad Professor and yeah, Revolutionary Dub Warriors. But yeah, a bit of Bob Marley is always nice. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
il numero 31 di White Horse Lane, periferia sud di Londra, gli Iowa Studios di Mad Professor. Yeah. Un produttore indipendente, un dub master che ha contribuito in modo fondamentale a popolarizzare a nuove generazioni negli anni 80 e 90 il dub, e il roots e tanti altri stili di reggae, ha lavorato con personaggi leggendari come Johnny Clark, eh, Hugh Roy, Lee Scratch Perry, Michael Prophet e tanti altri dalle fondamenta del reggae, molto conosciuto in Italia che con grande eclettismo è passato ai remixes dei Massive Attack, ha avuto anche un ruolo molto importante eh, collaborando con artisti punk e new wave alla fine degli anni 70. Il reggae in the 70s were, was a lot more militant, in fact the most militant reggae came out in the 70s, you know, wherein sometimes the lyrics don't have to go on a rhythm track, but you know this rhythm track is coming with like some force and power. You have to remember we had several problems with black youths and police, like in the um, carnival and even when it wasn't carnival, you know. In fact, a lot of the laws now uh, came out because of the problems we had where police got nervous and even to this day if they see like maybe three or four black youths in the corner they would either want to know what they're up to or want to get them to move on because they think you're inciting so, or planning some trouble you know do you remember me remember me remember me remember me remember me yeah do you remember me remember me remember me remember me yeah yeah do you remember me remember me remember me remember me yeah remember me remember me remember me remember me yeah yeah do you remember me remember me remember me hey Now, never is there gonna be relief for me in this vague, distorted reality. I am afraid I am a haunted being, just like all of the other indigenous... We're the first one in Britain to make music, uh, reggae music popular, like um, having shabims and things. Nobody didn't know about shabims, nobody knew about raving. We first thing we started to um, have in this country was a hire from the vicar, a church hall, to have a wedding parties and things, then we started to have shabims and things, <laughs> right? We didn't have them kind of, you know, because when I came in this country, there was no blacks, no dogs, and no Irish. And then certain, certain Irish racialists attack us as well. The exciting moment is when we have a good party, but then the police are always trying to break it up. They don't like us enjoying ourselves. Every time we try to enjoy ourselves, the police always comes, took away every little drinks and anything, and trying to read it and trying to close it down and we, we fought back eventually and they sort of back off a bit. And when they sort of back off a bit, they leave us alone. Because <laughs> when they see we sort of get a bit, bit aggressive back onto them, then they stop, provoke us. <laughs> I remember this discussion uh, that we had. His old producer, Lee Scratch Perry, who's a, gen you know, a, a real dub master, one of the people who made it into an art form. And they were very closely connected throughout his career. So um, Lee Perry was staying in this flat in the Basing Street Studios. And The Clash had their album coming out, and it had on it a version of, Pol of Police and Thieves, which was a Lee Perry production sung by Junior Mervyn. I was curious to see how they would respond to this version of a much-loved reggae song that was a sort of real anthem for the punk generation because the message of Police and Thieves, you know, it, you know is, is one that's saying, don't trust the system. That was really the connection between Rastas and punks, really, was that they were both the underclass. They were both the rebel souls of their communities, you know. I have to admit that uh, Bob was a slightly alarmed by the punks. He was a bit 
confused. And he was like, who are these people? You know, I, I, why are they going around looking like this? And so I was explaining to him the connection and they were not interested in traditional fashion. People were pulling together their looks and it was a statement, you know. In the conversation, he, he really saw what I meant. And he said to me, he said, I don't really like to see those safety pins in the ear and the nose and things. But he said, I like to see a man who can suffer pain without crying. Do you remember me? Remember me, Come remember on. me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me? Punks identify with this police repression because the police didn't like the punks either, you know. They used to put a lot of pressure on them. They were almost anarchists, you know, there with their safety pins and antisocial. All loved reggae and they all wanted to do reggae. We had bands like um, The Clash doing things like Police and Thieves mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And at most, reggae gigs you got it most punk gigs they would like have a reggae band supporting them there was a project called rock against racism that had things like misty and roots and ruts dc and things like the regulars reggae regulars and so used to support so there was this kind of marriage going on and even on the other side you had a few punk chicks checking a few of the black guys as well you know naturally you know and vice versa you know yeah, you know, love goes on, goes around. Reggae really became the black punk music in a sense because it was a, it was a music that had a consciousness and that had an edge and it didn't have, it wasn't all smooth and sweet and stuff. But I went one day to a show to see The Clash and I love The Clash. And at that show there was a girl group called The Slits. Okay. And it's not that I particularly love their music so much, but I thought you know, what do their name and their attitude and everything that maybe, you know, we could sign one act in the in the in the punk world, which was which was the slit. So that was the only act really we signed. <laughs> viaggio in Giamaica dello scorso anno, quest'anno Londra, la grande città, è lo scenario delle nostre operazioni. Il nostro scopo del viaggio in città, qui per esempio siamo a Brixton, uno dei fulcri dell'emigrazione caraibica in città, la seconda ondata, quella che ha seguito la prima ondata, la cosiddetta Windrush Generation, quella di Notting Hill Gate più centrale rispetto a Brixton, lo scopo delle nostre operazioni, dicevo, è di andare a trovare le radici profonde dell'influenza del reggae nel pop, nel rock negli anni 70 attraverso per esempio eh, il marketing di Catch a Fire, primo disco internazionale di Wailers di Bob Marley, Peter Tosh e Bunny Wailer, l'influenza appunto del reggae sul rock e il pop e anche il grande favore che la musica giamaicana anche per i suoi contenuti militanti incontrò presso i punks proprio a Londra. Well, with Catch a Fire, Catch a Fire was the first time that I'd gone back into reggae music after moving away from it because I moved away from it in around 1966 or 1967 because I, I had got involved in, in, in the whole rock music explosion in England and that had taken me on that route. The only artist who still had, I had a connection with in reggae music was Jimmy Cliff but other than that I wasn't really involved and, and that was because I'd brought Jimmy Cliff to England. In the case of um, uh, Bob Marley and Catch a Fire. I, I, at that time, Ireland was really a rock label. We had changed from being uh, a reggae singles company into being more of a rock company. And um, so when I, I met with Bob, obviously I hadn't lost any of my love for Jamaican music. And it was also great to meet him because I'd released a lot of his records without ever knowing him before. 
firstly the one cup of coffee, the first song, but then later on put it on, bend down low, a lot of other songs which I really, really liked of his, but I'd never met him. Um, and then when I met him, I felt that, and now, now if you can imagine it, I was really much more in the rock business than the reggae business. And so when I met Bob, <clears throat> um, I felt at that because of who he was and his presence, that he could, he sh could and should really be promoted more as a rock artist. And I was thinking in my head of the fact that uh, Jimi Hendrix had already become a black rock star. So it would really be possible for Bob really to do uh, the same. Abbiamo lasciato i quartieri dell'immigrazione giamaicana, ci siamo presi un diversivo oggi, siamo a Camden Town. Punk music, magliette di gruppi punk ma anche accessori mods, si può trovare di tutto, una zona molto bella anche per, per i suoi canali, eh, una zona di, di incontri dove, dove trovi eh, i punks del 2009, dark ma anche comunque negozi di reggae, anche comunque cibo caraibico da queste parti, eh, mi viene in mente questo bellissimo video dei Madness, non un gruppo reggae ma un gruppo comunque connesso eh, alla musica giamaicana in qualche modo, i Madness prendevano nel video dell'omonima canzone la Tube per Camden Town e si ritrovavano per incanto ai Caraibi eh, sotto al sole, sotto alle palme con un mare bellissimo. Noi siamo usciti dalla Tube e invece abbiamo trovato questa giornata piovosa, fredda, anche se poi non così atipica per... Eh, l'estate londinese per il giugno londinese Camden Town non propriamente un quartiere reg ma un quartiere variopinto con questo bellissimo mercato un quartiere con negozi di dischi un quartiere che è stato spesso teatro di ottimi eh, locali dove si suonava musica reg e vediamo che cosa ci offre questo mercato anche magari in termini di qualche acquisto di dischi Sister Elizabeth, do you like reggae music? I love reggae music. I love it. How you got exposed to reggae music through radio? Yeah, from birth it's been playing so through my parents and my grandparents, my family, you know, they sing, we have some artists in our family, so, you know, it's the heartbeat. And uh, which artist do you like more? Uji Banton, love Uji Banton, love him, Rockstone. Well, what do you think about uh, the living of the Jamaican community now? Yeah, we have Jamaicans in our family. We're persecuted because of we are herbalists. But other than that, we persevere, so we give thanks to the Almighty.
i ricordi tornano ai tempi in cui per quelli come me che cercavano di entrare nei meandri del mondo del reggae la Giamaica appariva letteralmente lontanissima e Londra invece era un punto molto importante per incontri nei negozi di dischi o per approvvigionarsi eh, di dischi insomma era un po' la, la, la fetta di Giamaica più vicina a noi mi ricordo negozi storici a Soho come per esempio Daddy Cool i classici negozi come Dab Vendo, la Clapham Junction e soprattutto a Notting Hill Gate negozio che per la crisi ha purtroppo chiuso eh, da un annetto I, questi sentimenti oltretutto sono stati racchiusi molto bene da una delle primissime canzoni di Africa Unite che si intitolava proprio Last Train to Brixton one of the most important reggae shops in Brixton and of course in London. How's the life here in Brixton? Brixton life nice man, Brixton are the best. Brixton you, you have no problem as long as if you're part of the community, you're all right. The people them take care of you and you know it's a nice place to be. And Jamaican community is still nice here in Brixton? Yeah man, big up the Jamaica community, Jamaica community massive. I think we outnumber every other nation in this area. <laughs> this is Joe Little Jamaica in, in London. Brixton is the capital of England, not of, and capital of London and capital of all England. Yeah, this place to be. So when you come to England, make sure you come to Brixton. Bless it. Brixton is a main place that quite a few of our people come to meet each other and we, we sometimes um, discuss all the different things that has been happening and also it's a, it's a, it's a place that all, not just the Jamaican people but all different black people from different um, country and ethnic background comes together and we just unite in um, buying our goods, um, talking, and things like that. anni 70 questo quartiere, Brixton, uno dei fulcri dell'immigrazione caraibica a Londra, fu teatro di grandi mobilitazioni dei collettivi come per esempio il collettivo Race Today, animato da Darkus Howe, un amico personale di Linton Wesley Johnson, che era uno dei maggiori ovviamente poeti e agitatori culturali del movimento. Alcuni motivi scatenarono dei veri e propri riots da queste parti, per esempio un attentato eh, da parte di ignoti neonazisti rivolto verso una casa a New Cross dove era nata una festa serale di adolescenti caraibici in cui morirono parecchi ragazzi, 13 ragazzi morirono in questo incendio di New Cross, il cosiddetto New Cross Massacre. Brixton fu teatro quindi di scontri, mobilitazioni veramente al limite della lotta che molto spesso come mediatore Linto Quesi Johnson si offrì eh, di moderare couple of uh, acts that you were also involved in in the early days that straddled that divide to a certain degree. You have Linton Crazy Johnson. So what can you tell us about these UK-based reggae acts and that um, fertile creative period? 
Well, uh, Lyndon Kwesi Johnson was really unique and his first record, Forces of Victory, was really a, an, imp an important record. You know, it was something that everybody latched onto, listening to the words, what he had to say was really, really important. massacre which happened on the 17th of January 1981 when a West Indian birthday party was firebombed by some racists, some fascists, is the most horrific experience that black people in Britain have faced in the 20th century. Um, it was unprecedented. There have been individual acts of racist attacks but in that attack 13 young people died and 26 were seriously injured. You know, there were no messages of condolence from the Queen. There were no messages of condolence from the Prime Minister. War, war, war. Mr. Listen. Oppressive man, hear what I say. But what this tragedy did, it galvanized the black community and brought us together and we formed the New Cross Massacre Action Committee and was able to mobilize 20,000 people to march through the streets of London. A melancholy locked in a cell. Those hours of torture touching hell. Those blows that caused my heart to swell were well. And give the the government and the authorities noticed that we had some power and we were willing to take to the streets to use that power if they didn't do something about um, these racist and fascist attacks. And that was the Black People's Day of Action that happened in March of 1981, two months after the, the New Cross fire. No, no, no run. The did sound your siren on his war no. War, war. The tragedy of the New Cross fire galvanized the black community together and out of it came something which was very powerful, the Black People's Day of Action and um, it was the first watershed moment in the history of the modern black experience in Britain because it gave, <clears throat> it, 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 it made the authorities um, begin to put into, set into motion some changes and to deal with some of the problems uh, um, to do with racial equality and so on. It was the first significant moment um, since the 1958 Notting Hill riots. It was the most significant moment in our history. Reggae, we're 30 years down the road in the UK now. Um, the, perhaps the only surviving band that's performing and touring at the moment is Steel Pulse. Steel Pulse is still out there, still fighting, still promoting reggae, um, and Steel Pulse, uh, to date, is the most successful international roots reggae band from the UK. So reggae is still very important in the UK. When we started out, uh, we actually started out in the mid-70s and uh, we were actually learning to play at that time and we're from Birmingham and actually a district within Birmingham which is called Handsworth. 
which is a predominantly black community. And um, it was a hard... We met Chris probably maybe the summer of 1978. You know, um, probably just before we got on the Bob Marley tour. We've been around for a good part of 30 years now. And as you know, we started out with re re rebellions, um, things spiritually, things that are politically orientated. And, you know, since our start till now, there's been a brand new generation. Even more so, I mean, with the acts that have come in over the past few years, they're still coming through with pretty much um, political statements and, you know, the, the whole ideology of chanting down Babylon. The good thing about it that what we've been discussing 30 years ago is still pretty much um, a theme and a subject matter that is relevant today. So um, it is giving us a brand new lease of life when it comes to you know, the, the next generation to support Steel Pulse. Steel Pulse came from Birmingham and they had their own rhythm, which was great. You know, it, when people don't know music very well or know a, sp a specific type of music, like people will say, well, all classical music sounds the same or people would say all jazz sounds the same, or people would say all reggae sounds the same. Of course, it, it's nonsense, you know. The closer you get into it, you know the difference. And Steel Pulse, you know, from the first five seconds of a Steel Pulse record, you know it's Steel Pulse, because they have completely their own separate rhythm. They created a unique uh, thing, Steel Pulse. Very important, very, very important group. Well, punk doesn't really exist in the, in the form as how we knew it back there 30 years ago. And punk music was really the music that we use as a stepping stone to, to evolve and a, and a stepping stone to establish ourselves as a, you know, as a reggae entity and you know, um, for the world to recognize. Reggae in, U in the UK is one of the key catalysts behind pop music. I mean, between the kind of mid to late 70s and the early 80s, reggae was the commercial format in the UK. It came together at a point when punk came together with black music in the UK. So black music became commercial in conjunction with punk. It was a struggle between uh, the working class, the white working class, and the black working class at this point. And that brought together unity, which is actually still together in the UK with regards to music production. However, having said that, if you're black in the UK and making music, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's reggae or soul, your struggle to be successful is very different to your white counterpart. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me? Hey, now, never is there gonna be relief for me in this Punk is a music. Uh, that was born out of a really rough period in British history. I was young then, you know, and I remember what it was like. There were so many strikes. The garbage was piled high in the streets. There was a lot of IRA bombing. You just didn't know when you left the house if, you were, if your number was up. There was a lot of it going on. And what I mean when your number was up was be if you caught in a bomb and maybe you would die, you know? So it was a city really on the edge. No surprise that Johnny Rotten sang Anarchy in the UK. Quartiere eh, molto importante per l'integrazione della cultura giamaicana eh, nell'ambito della, della cultura di strada bianca, come per esempio testimonia una canzone come Guns of Brixton, scritta da Paul Simonon per i Clash e presente in London Calling, uno, uno dei loro migliori lavori.
When I moved from Jamaica in, in 60, I'm from Kingston with Bob Marley. Okay. Bob Marley is my schoolmate. Same area, Trenchtown? Yeah, Trenchtown, oh. yeah. Right, I've been here from the 60, but things, things was rough. Because you have to fight your way. They used to fight from up Labrick Road, right back to our Batix Road, St. Mark's Road. They say you must get out, but we couldn't care less. So we said we ain't going nowhere because but what they did not know, we, the Rasta man used to tell him, that these people is we, because we, we come from Africa, thousands and thousands of years, but they don't, they don't know. Everybody is one people. They didn't know because they, 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 they'd still go back and take the Africans and treat them rough. But the, the Indian used to tell him that, you remember, you are my brother. How did the Indian know that in America? When they go to America to take it, the Indian turned and said, you all my brothers, because you must come from something, yeah. right? Sizzler. The racism is there, but we just get on with our life. You understand? Because we can't really do nothing about that. Racism is going from like way back in history. So most of the people, they still have that in their minds. So we can't do nothing about that. But that's just their mind. We know we're free people, we're free-minded. The chain, the chain is boss. But it's just for them to like free up their mind and just let people just live. Because that's how we really want to just live and make enough money. That's the joy. Make a lot of money. My joy really is to go back to Jamaica, I go to Africa, go live. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, hey, now. What are your memories about the life here in the 60s? It, it was uh, better oh, than now. You used to get five pounds a week. You work for five pounds a week. And things was better anyway, because, but you could get a job. But you can't get no job now. Everything is finished mm -hmm. for everybody anyway. Well, and then the, the building them is changed because we are the one who make them put up all these new buildings. Because we fight because we never have no way to live over there. It's the same thing. It was not an uh, elderly house, but now it's all right now. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me. Hey, now, never is the Jamaican community that came into England revolutionized England. If the Jamaicans and the West and the Trinis, let's not forget the Trinis and Carnival, you know, if the Caribbean people hadn't come into England, it would be a much duller place and it would have contributed far less to the popular music of the world. It would be less of a hip destination. Why? Because, you know, the English were very straight-laced and, like, everything closes at 8 o'clock and so on. Now, you know, the Jamaicans, they were going to party. Nothing was going to stop them partying. They had the sound systems, which was a sort of portable cultural medium. The carnival is good, but it's not as nice as before because you have too much police. And they just like, have we just going around in one little circle? Sometimes you can't even... You see, like, this, is Cam this, is, this road that we're on now is Cambridge Gardens. And over there's Acklam Hall. This used to be big with the um, with the carnival, but nowadays the carnival coming like a joke. But we still come because it's, it's only once a year, so you have to come. If you understand, so we just keep on coming. And, and do you like reggae music? Yeah, we love it. And what what are your favorite sounds playing at the carnival? Well, you have Saxon, you have One Love, Channel One, you have Java. You have um, the next sound down here, so um, from um, Peckham, that plays on here so as well, um, Lord Gellies. Yeah, you have quite a, yeah, you have quite a few reggae songs, but you, you catch me off, girl, I can't really tell you the whole of them right now, you see me? Yeah, I know about the 60s. 
it was great life and it's still great. <laughs> Bit expensive at the moment, but it's lovely living around this neighborhood. Things are a bit tough at the moment. Compared to the 60s, things was more bubbly, you know. Things was really great in the 60s. Can't, you could bring back the 60s right now. <laughs> it's completely different different to Portobello Road. If you go into Brixton, you can tell the feelings that these people are definitely Brixton people. Around here, you find more friendlier people. There's more uh, violence down there, there's more, fr more frustration, I don't know, the peopleism. So, I think so, you know, because there's violence everywhere, but you don't pick it up very regularly around here. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. The carnival changed now because you got pay, pay different people take it over. It was uh, Frank used to run it from All Saints Road. I used to play the band, so I used to play music too. And but everything changed now. Then they bring in this and they bring in that, and all the big shots take it over now. So it's actually mash up. The carnival is actually finished because we are not partaking in it again. Everything gone. We just backed out because well we get in age now. The younger one, them taking over. But when them taking over, now they do it different. We still got place in our tabernacle, Rowan All Saints Road, where we couldn't meet together on All Saints Road. But Was it like a, a, commu a community place, the commun tabernacle? Com there, there's no community now. Because we was the community, and all of we split up. So all the, the younger kids, them, they are trying to do it. But they can, uh, the other people them kind of push them out, so they, they ain't get going nowhere. What are your, your all-time all favorites concerning Jamaican music? Uh, uh, Bob Marley, uh, Stranger Cole, Alton Ellis, because we all grew together in Trenchtown. All those guys is part of the music scene from in the 50s. So we all truly grew together. All of them is my friend. London is the place for me. London, this lovely city, you can go to France or America, India, Asia or Australia, but you must come back to London City. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, hey. Now, never is there gonna be relief for me in this vague, distorted reality. I am. Ali Campbell era uno dei membri fondatori di UB40, un'esperienza molto importante che lega uh, il rock alla musica giamaicana. Uh, ha lasciato due anni fa il gruppo per problemi non solamente legati a politiche artistiche e sta intraprendendo una sua carriera solista. Uh, andiamo ad incontrarlo ai Kensington e parleremo quindi di lui uh, a proposito dei suoi nuovi progetti ma anche ovviamente della lunga e gloriosa carriera di Ubi Forti. Dobbiamo muoverci perché sta arrivando il treno e credo che dobbiamo prenderlo piuttosto in fretta. mention uh, racism and injustice so, and in, in those early days you were singing I'm a British subject not proud of it while I'm, I'm carrying the burden of shame is it something changed since, since those days? No, 28 years ago when UB40 started um, I think it was far more integrated 
you know, my generation were, were multi multiracial and multicultural, far more tolerant of each other. I think now um, it's very different. I think there's a self-imposed segregation that's happening with our youth. You know, um, some people can blame it on hip hop, you know, uh, and the, the gang culture. Um, but it's a self-imposed segregation, you know, and it's very worrying, you know, especially with the political climate, you know. We're now one in ten unemployed, again, you know, as, as it was when we, when we wrote one in ten, you know, it's, it's come around again. But I think it's a, it's a more severe and a more segregated climate that we're in, you know, which is very worrying. About your very beginning, how, how um, you got exposed to reggae in, in Birmingham? Well, I lived in an immigrant area, predominantly Asian and West Indian, you know. So I love Asian music too. But the music of the streets was, was reggae, you know, or was rock steady in those times, you know. I mean, I've loved reggae since I was 10 years old, you know. Never and you got those uh, th that very strong name you before that were uh, that was the unemployment uh, form. So how that idea came to to get th that name? We were all unemployed, <laughs> quite simply. And a friend of ours said, "Why don't you call yourself after the unemployment benefit form, UB40?" Yeah. Reggae is really a music of truth, or certainly that conscious reggae. It's a music of inspiration, and it's a music that very bluntly confronts some of the harsher realities of our existence. And at the same time, often they give it a hopeful twist, as Bob did in Exodus. So it has a lot of resonance. It's very rich. It's not just something completely disposable. That's why you know, reggae continues to grow. But I think before we finish this discussion, I have to put in a word for dub. Mm. Because dub music was the, really the transformational, the, arguably, yeah. I regard that as Jamaica's, mm. really the greatest gift to the world, dub. Zion, Babylon. Zion, Zion. You became quickly very famous as, as dub master, and uh, I don't think very quickly. <laughs> yeah, relatively no. quickly. No, no. I mean, I started experimenting. Yeah, I started experimenting, and you know, it it didn't happen quickly. When I, by the time I started, the guys who were doing it, obviously, you had Tubby's, Errol Thompson, um, Jammies, Lee Perry. Uh, uh, and so forth, and you had like scientists coming, coming from Jamaica, you know, and in London you had really and truly uh, Dennis Powell, Adrian Sherwood, you know, and that's it. So I, you know, I was doing some experimenting, and then I, you know, I hooked up with Shaka, and then um, you know, I was just starting my studio, and Shaka discussed like doing an album, uh, Commandments of Dub. And, and I had in mind to do this, um, this, this dub me crazy thing. So we both were coming in like at the same time as like the new 80s UK dub mm -hmm. people, you know. So we got together in the early 80s and we put on tracks for his um, commandments of dub. And so it took maybe about three or four years really after qui vicino a Portobello Road, gli studi di registrazione e di missaggio della Island Trading e abbiamo un personaggio particolare, Paul Gaucho Michael, che ha iniziato facendo il runner negli studi e poi ha lavorato veramente con grandi nomi sia del reggae che del rock. Lo vediamo in studio mentre sta lavorando sulla musica del grande cantante senegalese Baba Mal. The 
different one. Let me see. Thirty. Okay, we're gonna uh, check the rhythm section. Everything's good? You know very well uh, Bob, Peter and Barney. Can you spend some words about the, the three of them? Peter was um, an un uncompromising type of a, a person but he was very um, erratic. Um, the difficulty was of trying to work with him is that he would say he'd do something and he'd change his mind. Bunny, on the other hand, was somebody who, once he made a decision, uh, and he, uh, he always pretty much stuck to it. And I found him easier to work with only because he would say what he wouldn't do. You know, and he would be clear about it. Uh, uh, but the three of them, are really extraordinary talents, if you think about it. The records that, that Peter Tosh has made and that Bunny Whaler has made is extraordinary. They come from one, one group. One of the things that really drove Bob in his life, he was compelled to build a bridge through the African diaspora. That was one of his key motivations. And having been, having drawn so much from people like Curtis Mayfield and the Impressions and American black music, rhythm and blues, etc., it meant so much to him, even gospel to an extent. Um, you know, he'd always been longing to connect with black America. But ironically, and it was a bit disturbing for him as he went around America and did his shows, it was all hippies, all white people. Not that he was anti-white people, because he wasn't, but he would have also liked to make that connection. It was a bit frustrating for him. I still have a dream this afternoon. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me, remember me, remember me, hey, now? I think uh, through Bob and the records uh, you, you did together, reggae music literally changed the life of, of probably millions of people in the world. How are you feeling this responsibility you have? Well, I feel very honored and very lucky to have played a part in it <clears throat> because I must honestly tell you that I think Bob Marley was such a strong talent that he would have made it anyhow. Do you know what I mean? Um, uh, because he, he really was a really ex extraordinary talent. Uh, I, th I think that I helped guide it but it would, have, it would have happened anyhow in a different way because his material was too strong and he was too strong to, for it not to happen. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me, remember me, yeah, yeah. Do you remember me? Remember me, remember me. Straight from Africa, you can hear it, you can hear it. You can hear it, 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 you can hear it.